today we are going to start with our company law so I'm going to discuss with you all first of all the nature of information of companies as uh, provided by the Companies Act 2016 <coughs> so a company in Malaysia is being incorporated under the Companies Act 2016 this is our latest act whereby the uh, Companies Act previously had already been abolished and replaced by this new statute. So let us have a look at section 18, section 1 of the Companies Act first, whereby and in, inside this provision it states that upon the date of incorporation, specified in the notice of registration issued under section 15, this notice of registration will be issued under section 15, and by the issuance of this notice of registration, there shall be accompanied by the name and registration number as stated in the principal registrar cap uh, by the registrar of companies. This is by CCM, the Commissioner of Companies, Ma, Malaysia. Okay. And under section 19, under section 19 it says that this notice of registration actually is a conclusive evidence that the company is a, is, is a legal company and is already been incorporated. And once this notice of registration had already been issued, under Section 20, Subsection A, the company now has its legal personality whereby it's been separated from its members and it will continue in existence until it's removed from the, regis from the register. So previously, in the old acts, for a company to be incorporated, they must have the certificate of incorporation. So once they have a certificate of incorporation, this is actually an evidence that the company had already been incorporated. But now, the situation is different since we have this new statute, the Companies Act 2016, whereby the certificate of <coughs> incorporation is not a necessary. However, if the company uh, wanted to have this certificate, they can actually pay a certain amount of fees and the certificate of incorporation will actually be issued to the said company. And under Section 20 of the same statute of our Companies Act 2016, companies shall be capable of exercising all functions of a body corporate once they already be issued with the notice of registration. Okay, let us have a look now how it will lead to form a company. So under Section 14, Subsection 1 of the new Companies Act, of the Companies Act 2016, a person, if you see there, I have lighted, I have, uh, I, I have lighted the word a person. Okay, I emphasis on this. I put a color purple for that. So meaning now, one person, he alone can already form a company. So what he need to do under section 14, subsection 3, he can make an application. He need to fill in the form so he can get this form from the uh, companies, uh, commissioner of companies Malaysia. And in that application for incorporation, meaning in that application to form a state company, he shall include a statement of every person who desire to form a company with regard to this, to, to, uh, to this detail. What is this? What is the name of the proposed company? Whether this is a private company or a public company? And what is the nature of business? Whether this is agriculture or whether it involves industrial? It has to be clarified in this, in this form address of the registered office of the state company, the name, identification, nationality, and ordinary place of business of every member, director, and secretary, if any. If, if, if they have a secretary, then of course the detail of the secretary also need to be in, included. <coughs> and whether the company is limited by shares, the details of class and number of shares taken by, by a member of the state company. And if this is a company limited by guarantee, Whereby I'm going to discuss this in detail later on under our next topic. If this is a company limited by guarantee, the amount up to which the member undertakes to contribute to the asset of the company in the event the company is being wound up. If in the case of insolvency, if, uh, if this is a company, we don't call it as bankruptcy. We call it as the winding up of company. Penggulungan syar syarikat. And apart from the details which I have... Uh, elaborate on you uh, which I have elaborated to you just now so apart from that the, the 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 person who actually file that form application to form a company need also to file together with that under section 14 section 4 a statement 
from each promoter or director confirming that he consented to be appointed as promoter or director of the said company and also he is not being disqualified under the Companies Act to act as a promoter or director. So why he's being disqualified? This again, I will discuss this in detail later on. So most of the time because they have committed an offence under the Companies Act. So okay, now we go on with the availability and reservation of name. So since this now, I told you inside the form, uh, so <coughs> they have to put what is the name of the company. So what are the name which is actually proper to be filed uh, and, uh, with the uh, CCM? So under section 26 of section 1 it says, a company will not be registered by a name that in the opinion of registrar undesirable, unacceptable or identical as the case may be. So meaning if this case, uh, if the name which is chosen is sensitive to certain races or maybe it's not acceptab acceptable because of certain issue, then under that situation the uh, registrar of companies will not approve this name. Or maybe the said name had already been used by other companies then under that situation, it will also not be allowed under the said situation, meaning uh, this person needs to find another name. So, under section 37, section 5, if this name is approved, okay, then upon payment of the prescribed fee, the registrar, registrar of companies, will reserve this name for 30 days from the date of launchment of the asset application. Why 30 days? So, this 30 days actually is a grace period whereby if there is an objection file, you know, within, it needs to be filed within these 30, 30 days. So let's say everything is okay, then of course the company can use the seat name. Okay, meanwhile, how actually the company is going to operate since the name is not approved yet. Okay, so meanwhile as a temporary measure, the company's registration number. Remember just now said that once there is a notice of registration, the company is said to be incorporated and it already have a legal personality. Okay? And once the notice of registration is issued under Section 15, the company will have its registration number. So, meanwhile, the company can use this regist registration number. Okay, so just now, I inform you that the notice of registration will be issued under Section 15. So, now let us have a look at Section 15 and... So let's say all the uh, requirements which I have discussed with you earlier under section 14, they have been complied and upon payment of the prescribed fee, the registrar of companies then will enter the particulars of the company, the particulars which have been filed by the person who, by the person who wanted to incorporate the company just now. So these particulars will be entered into the register, okay, and uh, the company will be given, will be assigned a registration number of the said company and then the notice of registration will be issued. Once this is being done, then now the company can start, uh, can start its operations. So once this happens, then the company is being registered and it's been considered as a separate legal entity and have an unlimited capacity under Section 20, 21. So the particulars filed with the registrar in the application for incorporation, this will specify actually what is the part of which the company belongs to, whether this is agriculture, whether it's industrial, okay? So this uh, will be stated under, uh, under the particulars which have been filed just now and of course uh, it will be endorsed in the register by the registrar of companies. So at the moment there are three types of company in Malaysia, this is under section 10, section 1. What are the three types of companies? This is a company limited by shares, company limited by guarantee and unlimited company. And I will elaborate this to you in detail now. So what is actually a company limited by, sh by share? A company limited by share according to section 10, subsection 2 of the Companies Act. So these types of company, the liability of its members is limited to the amount of share which is unpaid. Okay, so the members of the company, when they acquired the share, they paid for the share, right? So if the share is being fully paid, then of course this member, the shareholder, will not be liable to the said company. So meaning the liability of the company is the liability of, comp of the company, is not the liability of this shareholder. What will happen to the shareholder is that 
the shareholder will only lose the sh lose his share. That's all. However, if the state share is not fully paid, so meaning he acquired the share, however, he did not paid the whole amount of the share yet, maybe he only paid 50%, meaning there is another 50% which have not been fully paid. So he will be liable up to this 50% which he have not paid. So meaning the creditors of the company can go against him for that 50%, uh, the one he owes the company because he did not fully pay the same share. So that's why I say here, the liability of the, the member depends on whether his shares are fully paid or not. If he has fully paid the share, then he has no further liabilities. So meaning the creditor cannot go against his personal asset. This is very different from partnership. Yeah, however, if let's say the state share is not fully paid, then the creditor can go against him with regard to the share which he has not fully, fully paid. Okay, so let's say if the share is fully paid, then he will be liable to contribute to the company's asset up to the amount, which I informed you earlier, which he has not paid. And let's say call was made because he has not fully paid for the share, right? He only paid 50%, so meaning another 50% he owes the company. And he has been called up to, to, to settle this amount and he failed to do that, no payment has been made then this share under section 83 can be forfeited by the by the company. Maka saham-saham yang belum dibayar itu boleh disita dari dia. Okay, uh, so dia akan hilang lah. He will lose this share. It's being forfeited by the state company. And under section 11, subsection 1, a company limited by share can, can either be a private company or a public company. So if this is a public company, we can see the word Berhad at the end of the name of the company. So let's say ABC Berhad, this is a public company. This company will be listed at uh, KL Stock Exchange, okay? Whereas a Sendiran Berhad, this is for a private company. So let's say the name of the company is ABC Sendiran Berhad. So this type of company will not be listed huh, in the uh, stock exchange. <coughs> One, I will, I, I, will, I will discuss with you later on. So, now let us go on with the second types of company, which is company limited by guarantee. So, what is the company limited by guarantee? So, according to section 10, subsection 2, liability of its members is limited to such amount as the members undertake to contribute in the event of its being worked up. <coughs> so, meaning, these members, if this is a company limited by guarantee, Company limited by guarantee, they, they, they does not have share capital. So under that situation, the member is not a shareholder because there is no requirement to to acquire share in a company limited by guarantee. So there is no no need for the members to to contribute on the share capital. So what what happened in this kind of company is that this company that's why this type of company they must have a constitution. The constitution is the internal law pertaining to that company. Why? Because inside the constitution, it will state actually how much actually the amount the members is going to guarantee. And he will be liable up to the amount he has guaranteed. He akan menyatakan berapa banyak yang dia jamin. So if let's say the company is being wound up, then berapa banyak yang dia setuju, dia mengaku janji untuk menjamin, he will be liable up to that amount. He need to pay up to that amount only. Okay? So that's why number three says here, the liability of the members to contribute to the asset of the company arise only in the event of winding up. Hanya berlaku jika company menjadi digulung uh, digulung syarikat, berlaku pergulungan syarikat. If there is no winding up, if the company is still solvent, then of course the member will not be liable. So uh, why why uh, we refer to the word members? Because meaning of members is more wider compared to shareholder. Because in company limited by guarantee, they don't have shareholders. Okay, so they have only members, ahli sahaja. Okay, so if let's say there is a case of winding up, okay, then of course uh, the state members actually is being required to, contrib to contribute up to the amount where... So this amount is actually specified in the constitution. So that's why this kind of company, they need to have a constitution. Okay. So let's say if the if the member had already left the company, will he still be liable? 
he will be still he will still be liable within a year before the company is being wound up okay so within that year then suddenly the company is being wind up he will still be liable within one year okay. so okay if this the company is, is still sovereign of course there is no problem because the member will not be liable at all so this kind of company let us have a look at section 45 sub 1 this type of company a company limited by guarantee they are being formed actually most of the time to run a charitable foundation so that's why you see they, they don't have shareholder because the purpose what is being formed is for charitable foundation research association etc okay so that's why how they are being maintained they are being maintained through donation endowment speech and subscription subscription uh, so sometimes uh, um, the members of this kind of company ngos they have this kind of community it's a research institution whereby they conduct research for the wild life this is an example of uh, of a uh, company limited by guarantee or this is ngo yayasan whereby they help the poor by giving scholarship so from where they raise funds this is most of the time is actually from donation okay and the purpose actually from from all this uh, money they receive the main purpose actually is to achieve or to promote the object of the state company and this kind of company they should not hold land unless okay uh, and approval is given by the minister so company limited uh, company limited by guarantee is only a public company so that's why they can only have the words berhad so this type of company cannot be formed as a private company okay what is unlimited company so unlimited company there is no limit on the liability of its members okay and upon winding up if the company becomes insolvent menjadi tak mampu bayar bankruptkan pergunungan syarikat members of the company are liable for the debts of the company without without limit okay if if let's say the asset of the company is uh, not sufficient so uh, this company can uh, be a private company or a public company and this company does not have a share capital so why this company does not have a share capital so because this kind of company is rarely been used as a trading company so biasanya bukanlah satu syarikat untuk uh, buat urus niaga perniagaan okay so most of the time they are mutual fund okay tabungan bersama and the asset is through investment and they and the and they divide the income okay uh, and uh, the income is actually from investment uh, to shareholder from this investment to shareholder so uh, the, uh, we have this I cannot say Tabung Haji, Tab Tabung Haji actually is a is a public company, however, it's similar something like Tabung Haji, whereby uh, people actually uh, put their fund there, okay, and uh, it's not for trading, yeah, however, they invest it, and from that income, from the, the money which is uh, being deposited by the by the members, it's being invested, and uh, if they receive income, they're going to distribute it to the to the members okay so let us differentiate between the public and private company so what is a private company so a private company if we look at section 2 it says here any company before uh, this act is being enforced is already been registered as a private company so well now it's a private company it's being formed before this as a private company in, uh, from any other written law so it will still exist as a private company or if the private company wants it's incorporated meaning in the form so the person who apply for the application put it as a private company then it's a private company so or any company which is being incorporated which is being converted from a public company into a private company then this is a private company okay so meaning by looking at this definition under section 2 we didn't know actually what is the characteristic of a pub of a private company and because of that we need to go through section 42 subsection 1 whereby under this section then only the clear then only the uh, elements of a private company will be will be more clearer so under this section we, we can uh, see from the section it says a private company is a company limited by share having not more than 50 shareholders okay so now we know that uh, uh, that a private company the uh, maximum number of shareholders is 50 percent okay 
And this kind of company, you go for the shall receive the transfer of its share. So meaning it cannot transfer its shares to the public. And so under section 42 sub 3a, it says here, the joint holder of share will be counted as one. And a shareholder who is actually an employee of that company will not be uh, calculated, will not be counted as shareholder. Will not be counted as the 50 uh, members just now. Okay. And this private company is limited by share and it cannot offer its shares or debentures to the public, to outsiders, and cannot allot, agree to allot any shares or debentures with a view to offer such securities to the public. So meaning, not only they cannot offer share to the public, they cannot allot, tak boleh tawarkan uh, saham atau debenture kepada umum, tidak boleh memberikan juga atau tuju untuk mengeluarkan, memberikan mana-mana saham juga kepada umum and they cannot invite the public, tak boleh mempelawa public to deposit money ya, untuk meletakkan wang ya, with the company for fixed period or payable at call whether bearing or not bearing interest tak kira walaupun tak tidak tidak uh, uh, letakkan duit tidak memberi faedah pun sama cannot ya. so anything to to do with the public we need to offer anything to the public in any form it is not allowed for a private company and the board actually the board of director they are being subjected to the constitution uh, and they to approve the fees of the directors and any benefits payable to the to the directors okay so how how much fees is to be is to be paid to the directors this one will depends on the constitution so this is a private company so and private company also we have exam private company so what is an exam private company an exam private company according to section 2 these are the company whereby uh, the share of which no beneficial interest is held directly or indirectly by any corporation. So I have uh, highlighted in purple whereby a corporation cannot hold share of this company. So meaning the shareholder of exam private company must be an individual, human being, normal human, human being like us. And the shareholder cannot be more than 20 members. Okay. And of course, just now, I have told you earlier, it cannot be a corporation. Syarikat tak boleh pegang saham. Syarikat, syarikat yang exam private company. The special features of exam private company is that this company can make loans to its directors. Okay, can make loans to its directors or from entering into any guarantee. Meaning the directors can, can, can guarantee or provide any security in connection to loan which is made for directors. So meaning, I think because this is a small company, whereby the members, there's only 20 members, they know each other. So that's why uh, this kind of company, they can actually make loan to the directors and also can enter into guarantee so that a loan is being provided to the directors, if not for the directors, uh, to any person who is connected to the directors. Okay, so it's not wrong uh, for this company to do that. However, for public company, this cannot be done, right? Okay, in lieu of financial statement and report, so meaning sebagai gantian, in replacement of financial statement and report, because um, this private exam, exam private company, no need for them to file this financial statement and report with the CCM, okay? So, if they no need to file, to file financial statement and report with the CCM, what need to be filed? No, just, they just need to lodge a certificate uh, that says that actually they are exam private company okay because why because this document financial statement and report this is for public company for public companies outsiders need to know because they wanted to invest in this company however this is exam private company the company is very small they know all the members 20 members so under the situation is now need to be public with regards to the financial statement and reports of the state company okay so what is a public company so a public company under section 2 this is a company other than the private company and this company can raise funds from the public so meaning what cannot be done by a private company the restriction which is being imposed 
uh, to a private company, so that restriction is not applicable to a public company. Okay? So, meaning, I said here, number three, so they are not being affected by the limitation, by the restriction, which I have discussed with you earlier. Because this is a public company. So, meaning they can offer share detentions to the public. And so, uh, the fees and any benefit payable to directors of listed company and its subsidiaries shall be approved at the general meeting. This is very different from private company just now because private company, this one depends on the constitution. However, if this is public company, cannot, it needs to be approved at the general meeting by the shareholder. Okay? So, okay. So, a private company can be converted into a public company by lodging a special, special resolution with the Commissioner of Companies Malaysia or it can be made public company involuntarily. Why? Because the private company had contravened the restriction which I have discussed and have highlighted to you earlier. Okay? In fact, public company also can actually convert into a private, com private company also by lodging a special resolution. Okay? Of course, that restriction will be applicable to this company. They need to follow the restriction before they can convert their company into a private company. Okay, so then let us go on with promoters and pre-incorporation of contract. So who is, who is actually a promoter? So a promoter, this is a person who desire to form the state company. Remember this now, we have gone through section 14, whereby section 14 says a person can incorporate a company. This person, according to section 14, need to do this thing, this thing, this thing. Who are actually this person? This person is known as the promoter because he is the one who takes the initiative to take the step to form a company. So let, let us have a look at my words here. It says, this is some person desiring incorporation to take the step to incorporate it under the Companies Act. Okay? He takes the initiative to, do all, to, 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 to comply with all the procedure which I have discussed with you just now. Okay, and under the Commerce Act, there is no precise definition of a promoter. It only referred to a promoter as uh, a person who have, who, ha who have a liability with regard to the prospectus. Okay, because if a company is being formed, this company must have a pro prospectus. So a prospectus is some sort like a resume, some sort like a brochure. Okay. Uh, then the liabilities of the company, the objective of the company, the introduction of the company, what the company is going to do, all is inside the prospectus. Okay? And because if a, if, if, if a person wanted to invest in a company, the first thing they are going to go through is the prospectus. Okay? A prospectus is like an invitation to the public to invest in the company. Okay? So let's have a look in the, the case of Tycross versus Grant, whereby this case actually defines who is actually a promoter? So this case said, a promoter is a person who undertakes to form a company with reference to a given project and, and to set it going and who takes the necessary steps to accomplish that purpose. So he is the person, the important person uh, who makes sure that the project will go on and he, take, he takes the necessary step to accomplish that mission. So this is actually the promoter. So a person who carries out the procedure which I have listed down under section 14 is now, okay, to incorporate a company such as proper preparing and lodging the incorporation documents, normally they are known as the promoter. However, whether a person under the law is regarded as a promoter or not depends on the question of fact. We need, we need to look at the circumstances of the case first before we can say whether this fellow is a promoter or, or not. The promoter no need to be a natural person. A corporation can also be a pro promoter. Okay? So, however, there are certain people who actually, it is actually uh, their job actually to form a company. So, like lawyers, it's their duty, this is their professional duty, whereby, okay, the person who engaged them, the person who gave them the instruction, that person actually is the promoter. 
not the lawyer who formed the company. Okay, so they did this because it's their their job. That's all. They are not to be made liable to the said company. Okay, so that's why I do. I I put an example there. Say a lawyer who draws up the memorandum article association of the company. This is their job. They are being engaged to do that. The promoter actually is the one who engaged them. And there are certain people who are being uh, prohibited to become a promoter. Why? Because uh, I will discuss this with you later on in detail. However, in brief, actually, these are the person who had committed offences under the Complice Act. And under Section 14, Section 4, this promoter, they are required to file with the registrar a statement saying that they consented and they did not lost the qualification to become a promoter. So let us have a look at the duties of promoters. A promoter actually is not the agent or the trustee of the company. However, it is set a law that they stand in the fiduciary relations to the company they were creating. So why? In the case of Lenger, it explains why. However, let us have a look at the case of Lenger versus New Sobrero Postfate. Well, but in this case, this Elenja and his friend, they form a syndicate uh, to lease an island. They lease an island for mining for spade. Then this Elenja and the member and, and, and the member of the syndicate, they later on form a company and they bought this lease, this this island, the lease of the island. They bought it. Um, they form a company and the company bought it, bought this lease. Okay. So I'm I'm going to discuss the case of Elenja later on in detail. But uh, in basic, that's what happened in Elanja. And why actually, we said that just now, that this promoter promoter stands in the fiduciary relation. This is because the promoter have this fiduciary duty, and this fiduciary duty is actually based on the basis of their influence and control. They have influence and control over the company, because they are the one who formed the company. Uh, which they have created and there are great potential that this influence and control could be abused by the said promoter and this will be detrimental to the said company and the members of the company. So that's why we said that this uh, promoter has these fiduciary duties. So when we said that the promoters have these fiduciary duties, promoter actually should act with utmost good faith. Mestilah bertindak dengan uh, orang kata niat yang paling ke suci hati, okay? And not to have a conflict of interest with the comp company that he is promoting. So there are three duties of promoter. We are going to discuss all these three duties one by one. The first duty, a promoter has a duty not to make any secret profit. I have lighted that. I have highlighted. Highlighted there in blue, cannot make secret profit profit out of the promotion without adequate disclosure. Okay, so once he disclosed and the company is willing to accept it, then it will not become secret profit. So meaning the promoter will not be liable to return it to the company. So to whom actually the secret profit he need to disclose? He need to disclose it to number one independent board of directors or to existing or future shareholders. So let us have a look at the case of LNG again. So just now, in brief, I inform you the case of LNG is that this syndicate, okay, they, they have uh, actually obtained this mining lease and then they sell off this mining lease to the company which they have promoted. Okay, so they sell off this property, this lease to the state company. So, the court had the disclosure, they did do, do the, uh, uh, they did, did disclose of this situation, however, the court had, the disclosure must be full, frank and explicit. It must contain at least information relating to the interest of the promoter and all material facts. So, a disclosure which is, not, which is half truth or partial truth can be defective and has no legal force. So meaning, if a disclosure is being done, however, the disclosure is not fully done. It's only half true, meaning this disclosure is not good enough. So in the case of Glass Pine, which is Barnes, what happened in this case, 
this promoter bought this Olympia exhibition hall at a discount. Okay, and then what this promoter did later on, he sell it off to the company that he is promoting and he make a profit. Okay, and he did not disclose it. And this is wrong and of course because this is wrong. Okay, so uh, that secret profit, he is not entitled to that secret profit. So let us go on with the second duties of the promoter. I highlighted that in blue also. A promoter need to disclose the commission or payment he is supposed to receive or the payment or commission he had already received. If he fail to do that, meaning this is also wrong, he is not, uh, so he is not entitled to receive it and of course the uh, company can actually uh, claim this from him. So if let's say the uh, promoter did not receive it yet, meaning there is a promise to pay however you have not received it yet then under that situation the company can enforce the claim toward the party who had promised to pay so let's have a look at the case of Wally Bridge Calico Printing Company versus Green and Smith so in this case the promoter failed to disclose actually that he have received this promise then he will be paid commission. Although he has not received the payment yet, the company could recover the unpaid balance of secret commission from the parties who have made these eh, promises. So the duty number three here. Eh? <coughs> so if a, comp if a promoter contract with the company, whether as vendor or purchaser, vendor as seller. So in the case of Elanger just now, the promoter acts as vendor okay that is wrong or maybe the promoter acts as a purchaser this is also wrong and of course this also need to be disclosed so under all the three duties just now if let's say the promoter disclose it then it will not be wrong it become wrong if the promoter fails to disclose so let us have a look at the case of Habib Abdul Rahman versus Abdul Kadir so if, the, if in the case of Elanjo just now, the promoter become the vendor, the seller. However, in the case of Habib Abdul Rahman, in this case, the promoter become the buyer. Okay? Two members of the company, they, they succeeded in rescinding the contract. They rescind the contract. They set, set aside the contract uh, with the uh, promoter. Because why? Because they said, the promoter fails to be screwed. So what happened in this case is this. So this company which is promoted by Abdul Kadir and another person, they bought land from another company. Okay. So they promoted this company, they formed this company and they, they bought this land and later on what they did, they divided into this land, into a few parcels and this land was later on offered to the public for sale. And what this uh, Abdul Kadir did, he later on, okay, formed a partnership, okay, with his friend, and what he did, he bought this land, one one parcel of the state land, he bought it under this partnership, and he did not disclose to the company actually that partnership, that firm is actually his firm, okay, and this failure actually, kegagalan ini, um, kegagalan memaklumkan bahawa dia adalah pembeli sebab Penjagaan perkongsian tadi adalah penjagaan dia. Okay. So this failure to disclose actually is is wrong. So if a disclosure is need to need to be done, to whom actually the disclosure need to be done? To all person who are invited to become members. Okay. And if this is if a public company, the disclosure can be done through the prospectus. Okay. And if this is a private company, maybe it can be done through a secular or through the annual general meeting. What are the remedies which is available to the company if, let's say, the promoters have breached this duty? The three duties which I have discussed with you earlier. <coughs> so meaning this promoter has failed to make a full, frank and proper disclosure. Okay? that they are making profit so this fiduciary duty actually is owned to the company 
So meaning the company is the one who suffer, who suffer damage, okay, because of the failure of the promoter to make a disclosure. And under that situation, if the comp because the company is the one who suffer damage, meaning that the company alone can take action against the promoter. If we have a look at the case of force versus saboteur, whereby in the case of force versus saboteur, force and to taunt, they are actually the minority shareholder in this case. They are now suing the uh, director because they said that the director of this company have misapplied, wasted and mortgaged improperly over the property of the company. So now they are seeking the guilty party to be accountable. Okay. However, they fail in their claim because why? Because courts held that actually you are not the proper plaintiff. You does not have the local standard. You bukanlah orang yang sebenar. You bukanlah pihak yang sewajarnya. Why? Because actually this force and teton, they are not the one who suffer damage. Bukan mereka yang mendapat mudarat. So the, 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 the party who suffer damage is actually the company. And under that situation actually, the company is the one who supposed to take action and not force the shareholder. Okay? So meaning if there is remedies available to the company, then the company is the one who should take action. Okay, because the company is the one who suffer damage. So if let's say the company take action, then the promoters will be jointly and severally liable for the secret profit. Okay, so let's say there are few promoters and one of the promoters is being sued by the company. Can the company then sue the other promoters? Can, because they are jointly and severally liable to the state company. So if let's say one of the promoter had paid the secret profit to the company, whereas actually it's not his alone who is liable because there are other promoters, he can actually seek indemnity from the other parties, from the other promoters. Unless his claim is being tried down uh, because of policy consideration, then it's a different story. So let us have a look at what are the kinds of remedies which is available to the state company. So one is rescission of contract, mengenepikan contract, put aside the contract. Secondly is recow can recover the secret profit. And thirdly, damages for breach of fiduciary duty. Can claim damages from the state promoter. So let us have a look at this. Let us have a look at this remedies one by one, a rescission of contract. So if let's say the promoters had actually breached his duty uh, by selling his own property to the state company or he become the buyer like the case of uh, Abdul Kadir just now okay, and he, he failed to disclose this transaction, what actually, what actually is his uh, uh, standing under that situation when he have breached the duty, then of course the company can recover the purchase price from the promoter, can actually set aside the state contract. And uh, if, let's say, the company set aside the contract, of course they need to return the property. They need to return the property to the state uh, promoter. If, let's say, in the case of Habib Abdul Qadir just now, they wanted to set aside the contract in that situation, of course they need to to return the purchase price and the state property will be returned back to the state company. So if, as in the case of Elanjo just now, what happened? The state contract is being rescinded, so the island will be returned back to Elanjo and his gang and then Elanjo of course need to uh, return back the purchase price to the state company. So however, not under all situations, uh, the company is allowed to rescind the contract. The contract can only be rescinded uh, under certain situation and they will lose the right to rescind the contract. However, if they lose the right to rescind the contract, they can claim other remedies. There are alternative remedies which I will discuss with you after this. So when actually they will lose this right to rescind the contract? First one, if they knew, knew of the true facts and they affirm it, setuju terima. Dah tahu ke ada sebenar dan setuju menerima keadaan tersebut. And secondly, when restitution integral is no longer possible. 
So meaning, under these situations, that it cannot be returned to the original state. Tidak boleh dikembalikan kepada keadaan yang asal. Then under that situation, not be allowed. So example, let's say if the property uh, cannot be restored in its, the land cannot be restored in its original situation, then of course, uh, rescission of contract cannot be allowed. In the case of the Gunas we tried, whereby uh, the company had attracted new threats from the ground and because of that, the court refused to allow rescission of contract. Why? Because now the condition of land cannot be restored to its original state. Or maybe the land had already been sold to other parties. Also, it cannot be restored in its original state. Or, thirdly, if an innocent party had already acquired the right to the state property, this is in the case of, in the case of release and highly theaters uh, of varieties limited. Whereby, in this case, court does not allow the rescission of contract. Why? Because the property had already been transferred to a third Okay, so that is rescission of contract. The second remedy is this is recovery of the promoter's secret profit. So that's why I say it's okay if the contract cannot be rescinded, there are other remedies. Okay, maybe the second remedy is more proper. So what is the second remedy here? Recovery of the secret profit which is being made by the state promoter. So the uh, company can claim this from the state promoter in the case of last time which is month just now. So in that case, uh, the uh, company can recover £20,000 from the promoter. So this is the selling of Olympia Exhibition Hall just now, whereby actually he obtained discount. However, he sell it to the company uh, and make profit. Now the company can claim that secret profit of £20,000. So in the case of Wally Bridge, So in the case of Wally Bridge, actually the secret profit, he haven't received it yet. However, a promise has been made that uh, he will be paid this commission. So the company can actually sue the, 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 the parties who have made the promise. They can enforce it. Why? Because under the situation actually, that amount of commission is being held as trustee on behalf of the company. Okay, so this is the final remedies whereby the companies can claim this remedy which is actually damages so under the situation of course the company can, uh, must must prove actually they suffered damage I must say buktikan dulu bahawa mereka telah mengalami kemudaratan dia barulah boleh menuntut ganti rugi ni uh, damages so uh, the company must prove that it has suffered loss suffered damage so they may sue for damages for breach of fiduciary duty or if there is fraudulent misrepresentation, deceit or negligence on the part of promoter. So in the case of release and highly theaters of Verities Limited, so just now we know that the contract cannot be rescinded because why? Because um, just now in the case of in the case of release just now, uh, it's not proper to rescind the state contract. However, the court said they can claim damages from the state promoter. Okay, how much damages need to be paid, this one depends on the secret pro profit received by the state pro motor. So now, let us have a look at the pre-incorporation contract. What really is a pre-incorporation contract? These are those contracts which have been made on behalf of the company when actually the company is not formed yet. The company has not been incorporated. So under common law, under common law, a company cannot actually enter into a contract before it's being incorporated. For this reason, okay, so if a con contract is being entered before incorporation, the company at that time, why? Because it does not have legal personality and because of that, they does not have contractual capacity. They don't have the capacity to enter into a contract. So if the, the contract is being entered before its incorporation, the company will not be liable. So this is actually under common law, under English law. So this is the English case, the, the case of Kellner versus Baxter, whereby these three person they made a contract to purchase goods. They wanted to to incorporate a hotel. However, the hotel haven't been incorporated yet, and they have purchased goods on behalf of the hotel. 
the goods that had already been supplied. However, it has not been paid, and later on, the company is um, the com uh, the company is being sold. However, the supplier is unable to uh, to obtain the uh, purchase price. Why? Because at that moment, the company is, does not exist yet and it does not have the capacity to enter into a contract. So what about Malaysia? Is Malaysia law similar to, to, to the English law? So in Malaysia, if we look at the case of Ahmad bin Saleh and others of Sarawang Hills Resort in Nebrat, whereby in this case, the plaintiff, Ahmad bin Saleh, they sold land to this Rawang Hills Resort at that time. The company have not been formed yet. What happened is that this um, Ahmad bin Saleh, he signed this power of attorney uh, to enable the land be partitioned. And in the agreement said that the process will take about six months to settle. <coughs> However, later on, Ahmad bin Saleh claimed that whatever he signed whatever agreement he entered is not valid because according to him the company have not been formed yet during that period of time however the court held that this agreement had already been ratified by the company once the company is being incorporated okay so then so what do you think of 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 our our law in malaysia is it different from the english law yes it's different why is different it's different because of section 65 subsection 2. So under our law, it states under section 65 subsection 2, so we have overcome this situation whereby under this section, okay, if let's say the company once incorporated, it choose to rectify, ya bawa undangan kita, apabila syarikat itu telah ditubuhkan, dia memilih untuk meratifikasikan, memilih untuk mengesahkan, meaning the company uh, choose to accept the state contract to ratify it, then under that situation, the contract will become a valid contract. Okay? This is quite similar to the law agency under ratification of agency, right? So, meaning our law uh, is different from the English law, whereby under the English law, the uh, company cannot ratify it. However, in Malaysia, we can ratify, the company can ratify the state contract one is had been incorporated okay so now let us have a look at the second case cosmic insurance corporation limited was a school shampoo whereby this mr ku he was op offered a post as managing director for life by the promoters so meaning this offer was made before the company is been formed okay and once the company had already been formed they passed a resolution Board of Resolution passed, meaning they they agree with what has been offered by the promoters to Mr. Ko. And however, later on, there, there, there is a disagreement. They don't want this Mr. Ko to become uh, their managing director for life. So that's why this case comes up. However, the court held, what the court held? The court held this valid. Why is it valid? Because remember, student, what I told you just now, our situation, is not similar to the English law. Why is it not similar? Because we have this section 65, subsection 2, which allow ratification to be done. And just now, this had already been, uh, ratification had been done through the resolution. Okay? So, once contract has been entered into by any person on behalf of the company before its incorporation, and secondly, it had been ratified after its formation, then the state pre-incorporation contract is valid in Malaysia. Okay, what is the effect? The effect is this, once the pre-incorporation contract is ratified, then the company is bound by the contract and is entitled to the benefit of the contract from the date the contract is made. Okay, not from the date of incorporation, however, it goes back to the date when the contract is made. Okay, student, now, what happened? Okay, if there is failure to rectify. Okay, I will discuss you this later on. We have a look at the case of Tai Hua Reti Sinia Berhad was a tour pengarah hasil dalam negeri first. Whereby this case said, under section 65.2, we said that can be rectified. 
the ratification can be done by some act showing an intention to adopt. Okay, maybe it's not in writing, however, through conduct of the parties. Okay, it's still valid. Through this act, it shows that their pre-incorporation contract is being accepted. Though there is silence, okay, uh, however, if we look at the case of Cosmic just now, it's through resolution. So through that resolution, resolution also it shows that the state contract has already been accepted. Accepted. What happens if there is failure? Failure to ratify the state contract. If there is failure, according to section 65 sub 1, so just now we, we have discussed 65 sub 2, so if there is failure to rectify, tidak ada ratifikasi, tidak ada pengesahan syarikat, okay? Then, the person who acts in the name or on behalf of the company to make the contract will be personally bound. So, meaning who will be bound? The promoters. Because the promoters is the one who entered into the contract. Meaning, if there is no ratification, then the case of Kellner versus Baxter will come into picture. Okay? Meaning, the, Kellner versus, the case of Kellner versus Baxter will be applicable under that situation. Okay, student, so thank you. That's all for today. Yeah, the discussion on uh, the formation of company, promoters and also the pre-incorporation contract. Thank you.